Well, good morning. Let's stand together. We're going to sing some songs of praise to the Lord. Before we begin, I want to draw your attention, especially if you are visiting with us today. You received this worship guide on your way in. There's information that will help you kind of know what's about. the. Everything's kicking off, so it's all in here. Um, but it's an exciting time to be a part of, of the church. Uh, and I don't mean just this church, just the church as a whole, the, the church of Jesus Christ. And so we're gathered today. Um, as you come in, there's also a card on the front that says, let's connect. You can fill out, place in the offering plate later. We would love to know uh, that you are with us today. Our pastor would love to give you a call. You can also put a prayer request on the backside. Uh, just let us know some circumstances in your life, and we uh, would love our staff praise for those every week, and we love getting to do that. But we're going to sing a new song to the Lord together, and I want to invite you to sing it out as we praise him today.
there's nothing like being happy in Jesus. Amen. We're going to continue to praise him for the things that he's done for us. Praise him today. There's nothing better than Jesus. Amen, church family. You can be seated. Aren't you glad it's the Lord's Day? And excited to be gathered together in his name to lift our voices in praise to him because he's worthy. 
He is always good and forever faithful. Amen. I'm going to ask a couple guys to come join me uh, before we take this morning's offering, and that's uh, Bill Hicks and Pete Striplin. If y'all are close by, y'all go ahead and make your way uh, down front. The reason why is because I want to take a moment to highlight a special ministry opportunity that's available uh, here in our community and is appropriate in light of the series that we're in on parenting and really investing in the lives of children our children as parents, or even others that you're going to hear about opportunity in just a second, but also just appropriate at the beginning of the school year when things are about to get back in motion in our county and city schools and beyond, and uh, for us to think about what ministry opportunities those, uh, those present. And so with that, I want you to hear about two things. Number one is read to grow in our county schools, and then mentor canes in our city schools. Now let me before you hear from these two gentlemen who've both been involved in these ministries impacting the lives of kids as a Read to Grow mentor or a Mentor Kane's mentor, um, most of the time when something goes wrong in the life of a child, a kid, or a person, their conduct or behavior unravels, things go south. A lot of times in the back of our minds, though we won't say this out loud, maybe we don't even think it exactly like this, but we sometimes think this to ourselves, I wonder what their parents did to that child? What did their parents do wrong? And oftentimes, most often, I think that's the wrong question. Because yes, it's certainly true that sometimes things can be done um, that cause horrible pain and destruction. But more often than not, um, when things go wrong in the life of a child or young person, it's not what their parents did, it's what their parents didn't do. They never provided unconditional love and acceptance that reflected the unconditional love of Christ. They never nurtured and spent time and attention expressing the value of that person in the eyes of God. They never expressed the love of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ to them to know and understand. They never gave them a godly example. They never spent quality time, love and affection and approval and on and on we could go. Most often the case is not what, what happened to them, it's what didn't happen. So with Read to Grow and Mentor Canes, here's an opportunity for the church of God to step in and do for others what, what, what may be missing in their lives. And, and how missing? Let me tell you the impact. They say right now, on average, across the state of Georgia, 48 out of 100 kids do not read on grade level. And did you know that if they don't read on grade level by the third grade, they're 27% more likely to be incarcerated? It's really one of the first steps that will cause them to falter in life if they can't keep up with their reading. And so with that being said, and all the other effects that come out of that and not having the presence of an investing adult in their life, life can come off the rails pretty quick. So, Pete, you've been a Read to, Min- a Read to Grow participant and leader now for about four years. And, Billo, you've been a Mentor Canes now for over a year. Um, these are about to kick back in to opportunity. I just want you to take a moment, Pete, maybe start with you and just share what difference have you seen this make in the lives of those you've invested in in your life and then how do people connect with that? And, Billo, I'm going to ask you to share the same thing. Well, I started Read to Grow the second year that it was in operation in Bartow County. The first year they, they did a test in four schools and four elementary schools to see how it went. And the, the uh, score, reading scores were so much higher at the end of the year f- that uh, they decided to implement that into all 12 schools the next year. And that year was the first year I worked and we were able to have people in all 12 schools from grade one through three, uh, first and second grade, we had four days a week in in all 12 schools in the county. And then the next year COVID hit. So we've been down considerably from there. But what I do is uh, we go and work with one, two, three, maybe four kids at the time who are having problems uh, reading, and uh, we help them learn sight words. We play games with them, uh, reading games, 
and just love on them for, for the main thing we do. And uh, like uh, Kyle said, it's it, uh, parents a lot of times do not give the kids what they need, and that is that's pretty obvious. After after I uh, you know meet with the kids several times, you you can find out you know uh, well do you do you do your parents help you with your sight words at night? No, they don't have time. They got too many other kids to play with or fool with. So, you know, it's it's very sad, uh, you know, the, the, the parents that, that don't help their kids and it, how important it is that they are reading at, uh, proficient by the end of the third grade. So uh, we're fixing to get started again this year right after Labor Day, and we're going to be recruiting now from now till then. And... Uh, so we would love to have you, and uh, it, I'll be around probably the next few weeks, and we're going to try to hit some of these Sunday school classes and, and recruit that way as well. Yeah. And uh, just let me tell you, it, it's a blessing. Uh, as the, next to the last verse in Psalms 23, he says, talks about your cup running over. Every, every Monday or whatever day it is I go, when I leave there, uh, I, sometimes I have to have a bucket, and, and my bucket is running over, and and it just uh, it's it's such a blessing to be able to do this and help these kids. Praise God! Thank you, Pete. Billo, tell us about Mentor Canes, your involvement there, and uh, how how people can get connected with that. Uh, yeah, Mentor Canes is. Uh, I didn't even mention this in the first service. I should have, but when you want to know what the difference is being made. And I said it was twofold in the first service, and that's true, but one of those is you see the difference on right then as you meet with this child. You'll see them go, you know, from one uh, level emotionally and so forth, and they begin to open up. And you see them laughing more, and you'll see them wanting to share more. Well, what that is is you become friends. And I don't know about you, but if you ever go through something tough in life, isn't it nice to have a good friend? And that is one of the main goals, is you make a commitment to be dependable and constant positive influence in this child's life. You're not going anywhere. I'm not going to go anywhere in this, in this child's life. Well, the other difference is the difference I'm hoping that the Lord will bring to fruit in the future. When this child is 16, 17, 20, he'll look back and then he'll realize the difference that was made. But there's a third thing I didn't mention in the first service. The other difference that's being made is in me, is I benefit from this. I've got a new, true, good friend. He just happens to be a lot younger than me. <laughs> but you know what? My day is elevated by spending time with him, and I enjoy that. I look forward to it. And something you need to understand, it's going to require you rearranging your schedule and some of the things to make this happen. The Lord will bless you for that. If you want to be a part of this, you will not regret it. You can find out how to reach Lori Shook in the schools. She's the one that emails all of us mentors. But if you're not sure how to reach her, just find the school you want to be a part of. Maybe it's closer to your house, closer to your work, whatever the case may be. Maybe it's the age level that drives you to have a passion for this, to reach out to a certain one. Just go to the principal in that school and say, I would like to be a part of Mentor Canes. They will roll out the red carpet. They'll get you everything you need to have the background check and that you'll have to do a short interview with some counselors to make sure you understand what you're stepping into and then you're off and running. And it'll be something that the Lord will bless you for and you will not regret it. I'd urge you to take part of it. Amen. Church, would you thank these guys for sharing? What a straightforward, clear way to connect to pour your life into the lives of others that desperately need it. The structure is all there. You just got to be willing to say, here I am, send me, use me. Ushers, if you would, come forward, and uh, I'm about to ask God's blessing as we give a portion of what God has given to us back. And guests, if you're among us, if you've not had a chance to jot down your information on that Connect card, you can do that now and tear that portion off, drop it in the offering plate, or if you don't make it in time, you can place it in the giving stations uh, later, but we're so glad that you're here. But would you bow with me as we pray this morning? Heavenly Father, we rejoice this morning because you so loved us, you sent your Son to intervene in our world and our lives. Father, lost in sin and shame and the guilt and the forever 
deserving discipline, judgment, and wrath that we rightly deserve, Father. And yet you loved us so much, God, you made a way of salvation and rescue. And Father, you lived a sinless life through your Son. Jesus, Father, walked sinless in our shoes. Father, he went to the cross on our behalf, Lord, where he died a sinless, perfect substitute for us, Lord, and defeated the grave, walked out, Father, never to die again. And Father, it's in that life and in that hope that we rejoice this morning and realize you've given us everything we need for life and godliness. God, I pray if anyone among us under the sound of my voice in the room or watching online today doesn't know the hope of the good news of Jesus Christ, today would be the day. Father, that you gave your son for them. Father, I pray that as we worship you for what you've done for us, that as we give back, because everything we have belongs to you, that you would take and multiply it for your kingdom. Father, I pray that just our giving wouldn't just be in the form of our finances, Father, but in the form of our talent, yes, our treasure, and our time. Father, to say, here I am, send me. Help us to see where you're at work around us. Help us, Father, to see opportunities that we can plug in and, Father, live sent, live on mission, speaking the gospel and fulfilling the good works you prepared in advance for us to do so we could point people to you and your goodness. Father, hear our praises this morning. Would you be glorified? Jesus, would you be exalted? And in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. It's okay if it's hard to believe I have faith that you will do greater things It's my time to go But before I leave Go tell the world about me much to do here before you Y'all didn't know, um, 
This is Ava's last Sunday before heading off to college, and so she's been such a staple in our praise team and leading with uh, John and others in worship. Ava, we're proud of you. She's backstage already and know she's going to go tell the world wherever God leads her, and uh, we're praying for you and all our other uh, new college freshmen. We had about three others in the first service uh, that raised their hand saying today was also their last Sunday before moving in, and that's a big step not only for them, but for their parents as well. Amen. So there you go, whether it's, you know, something that's a happy day, sad, or a little bit of both, right? You know, my goodness, we're never quite ready for that day. If you have your Bible, make your way to Lamentations, chapter 2. If you hadn't heard that book of Lamentations, forgot it was in the Bible, or don't know where it is, um, it's about a little past halfway. So you're looking for chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, if you need some kind of orientation, if you need to check the table of contents, no shame in that, but you're going to go Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. If you get to Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, you got too far. Start headed back to the left. So uh, Lamentations chapter 2 verse 19 is where uh, we're going to be. We are in our series on parenting. And so last week, if you missed that or if you heard it, just what we did was we set a biblical perspective to approach this thing to make sure that we're viewing our kids through the lens of Scripture seeing them as the gift from God that they are, the value, the sacredness of life, what's been entrusted to us, that they're not ours, they're God's, they're just on loan to us for a temporary time, especially while under our roof, until they're launched, literally released from a bow, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, the Bible says, to be sent to fly for the name and glory of King Jesus and to land in the destination that God has called them to and to make an impact along the way. So, But what we said we're going to do that we start today is we move into really the five tools or five biblical tools that God calls every parent to utilize in the lives of their kids. We talked about like baseball talks about a five-tool player. So a five-tool player is pretty rare, but that's a person that can fulfill all five elements or facets of the game well. Hit for power, hit for average. They can run, throw, and field all extremely well. What we want to be, if you will, is five biblical tool parents implementing all five things. These are not the only things, but the primary things that the Bible points us to, to be faithful in as moms and as dads. And so today, we take on that first one of the five the parental tool of parenting by the power of prayer. Before we dive in and read the scripture, though, I want to tell you a story. Her name was Martha. This was quite some time ago. This was um, so long ago. She was on bed rest before they knew what to call that. But she was three weeks after giving birth, still in bed, fighting for her life. Her infant son was in the center of the room in the cradle, the center of the room, because the family had started off by placing him in the cradle right by her bed, but her physical condition was such that she did not even need to attempt to rock the cradle. She needed to rest, but like any mother, instinctively, she couldn't help but what? Whenever he would cry, put that hand on that cradle and rock her son, despite the fact she didn't need to move. She needed to rest. So they were forced to move the cradle to the middle of the room, But on this particular day, Martha was alone. None of the other family members were there. Her infant son was crying, so guess what that mama did? She got out of that bed, couldn't even walk. She literally crawled to the center of the room, pulled herself up on the cradle, grabbed the hands of her infant son, and what she began to do was something she would continue to do all the years that she was alive as his mother. She began to pray for him. But this was really the very first time that she remembers praying and praying fervently for her son. She prayed more than that he would just live a blessed life. She was on her knees and with all the strength that she physically had, mentally had, emotionally had, spiritually had, began to call on God not only to save her son, which by the way should be the first request of every single parent and grandparent, that their child would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, put their faith in him and receive forgiveness of sin and salvation. She prayed that But y'all, she also prayed that God would call her son, that God would call him to a specific form of ministry. In fact, she actually called on God to call her son to preach, to be a minister of the gospel. Martha's son was a man by the name that probably you've never heard of, and that's okay, Lee Rutland Scarborough. 
He was one of the most famous, well-known, and effective evangelists and pastors in Texas in the early 1900s. He was one of the founding faculty members of Southwestern Seminary where I attended and was trained for gospel ministry. He would become the president of that school. He, in fact, would later become president of the Southern Baptist Convention for a period of time. He would become one of the greatest early Baptist leaders in the state of Texas, all, no doubt, as a result of his mother's prayers that she prayed beginning that day when he was three weeks old and she could barely get out of bed. I want you to listen to what, what he was known as, L.R. L.R. Scarborough wrote, knowing what his mama did for him starting at three weeks of age. Here's what he said. Parents should pray that God will call their children and make their home an atmosphere favorable to doing God's will. My mother gave me to the ministry in soulful supplication when I was three weeks of age. Don't miss this part. Parents, he says, can greatly help or hinder God in this matter. Parents can greatly help or hinder God in this matter. This matter of what? The matter of God's will and call on their lives being heard, realized, and lived. Parents, hear me, can greatly help or hinder in the matter of God's call, God's will, God's purpose, God's plan being heard, realized, and lived in the lives of their children. And no more can they help with anything else other than by the power of their prayers. Here's what I want you to hear this morning. Can I start with the good news? It kind of sounds like bad news, but it's actually good news. Nobody can or will be a perfect parent. Can I hear an amen? And guess what? Did you know that your kids don't need you to be a perfect parent even if you could? Because that's not what they need most. We beat ourselves up a lot of times for our mistakes and our shortcomings as parents. But guess what? Your child doesn't even need a perfect parent. Can you take a deep breath, everybody? Uh, Some of you never thought about that. I struggle to think about that. My child does not need, my children don't need me to be perfect. You know what they need me to be for them more than anything else? A praying parent parent. They need me to leverage the most powerful thing God's given me on their behalf, and that's prayer. Y'all, God has called us as parents to prepare and position our kids to know God and to love Him. I did not say God's called you to guarantee your kids know and love Him, because you can't. I didn't say God's called you to make your kids know Him and love Him. You can't make them. I said God's called you To prepare as best as you can and position as best as you can your children to know God and to love God. And the most powerful tool you have, hands down, to do that more so than anything else is the power of prayer. I want you to listen to the word of God in Lamentations 2 verse 19. Here's what the word of God says. Arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the night watches. Pour Out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Here it is. Lift your hands to him for the lives of your, fill in the blank for me, children. Let's read that again. Lift your hands to him. Him is God. For who? On behalf of who? For the lives of your, our kids who faint for hunger at the head of every street. What I want you to hear this morning is God commands parents to pray for their kids. God commands parents to pray for their kids. This section of the Bible, Lamentations, as it sounds, is not a celebration. It's a lamentation. It's a mourning. What's happened is, is that as God has promised, what happened if the Israelites were unfaithful to him, if they continually walked in rebellion against him, God said, cursing And judgment, not blessing, is going to come. And guess what? It came. God was true to his promise. In fact, Babylon invaded the promised land in 587 B.C. Destruction was a result. The loss of life as they knew it was a result. Many were hauled off to captivity. They're living in shame and in guilt. And they're mourning life as they knew it. Life has been turned upside down. And yet God is merciful. God is providing hope for restoration and renewal Through his power, through the means of calling his people, notice to do what to him? 
To seek him in what? Prayer. Call to me. Lift your hands to me. Pour out your heart before me. There's hope through prayer. Because prayer gives us access to the presence and power of God, which is what we need most. And by the way, it's what our kids need most, which is why they are called here not only to call out to God for their behalf, but specifically on behalf of their children to see God's presence and power realized in their lives, which is another way of saying that they could see God's will lived out in the kids and the lives of their kids. Because did you realize that we will not experience the will of God in our lives without God's presence and God's power? And prayer is the primary means that gives us access to those two things. Again, don't miss that. Prayer is the primary means that you connect with God's presence in God's power, without which you will not realize the will of God. So the presence of God and the power of God unleash the will of God to be lived out in our lives, which will not happen if we don't ask in prayer. You know the way James puts it? You have not because you ask not. And so we need to remember God has a unique, a unique plan for each one of us and our kids a unique path, a unique will for each one of us. He wants us to walk in it and to live in it, but it's not going to happen in our lives and it's not going to happen in their lives without the power of prayer, which gives us access to his presence and his power, unleashing his will in our lives. God commands parents to pray for their children so that God's will is realized. Not only when we think about this, I want you to think about the two sides Not only are we praying, y'all, so that God's will is realized in their lives, all that God has intended for them, planned for them, but we're also praying that God's protection is realized in their lives so that they don't experience what's not God's will. Yes, we're praying on the positive side for what God has planned and that full potential to be realized, but we're also praying that what's not God's will and all the potential there that the enemy wants for them is not realized. We're praying for both. And in fact, I want to explain praying for God's protection, that side of it, in a way you may have never thought about, and it may, it may be a way that would awaken you to the reason the challenge our kids face and the reason our prayers are so important for them. Let me, let me explain it like this. I've heard it explained in these words. Do you know the ultimate reason that parenting is challenging may not be for the reasons we often think it is. Number one, parenting is ultimately not a challenge because it's expensive, but it is. Amen? Parenting is ultimately not challenging because it's uh, time-consuming or exhausting, frustrating, demanding, never-ending, or complex, right? It can be all those things and more. But that's not the ultimate reason parenting can be challenging. Let me give you the two reasons parenting is ultimately challenging. And again, what are we talking about? We're talking about things we should understand and praying, not just for the potential of God's will in the lives of our children, but the protection against what's not God's will in the lives of our kids. And the two primary challenges that parenting is difficult is, number one, because of the pressure of the world. This is an external pressure, the external pressures of the world. Number two, and we're going to explain these, is the internal pressure of the nature of of your child, the nature of all of us, the nature of your children and mine, of me and you. It's challenging because we face an external pressure of the world. We face the internal pressure of our own sin nature. Let me explain a little further. First is the pressure, the external pressure of the world. Don't you know the world has a will and a way and a path it desires for your kids and mine, and it's not the will of God. Y'all, come on now, y'all don't know that? I need an amen to that. Amen. All right. Listen, the world's got a way and wants to have its way with your children and mine. And the load of information that is coming at our kids is unprecedented in human history. You say, Kyle, what do you mean? What I mean is just think about this. People that study this, sociolog- sociologists and others, remark that in the digital age in which we live, The electronic age in which we live, 
Every human being is now facing more content, more information in a single day than a human being literally would have encountered in an entire lifetime for the vast majority of human history. Just think about that. Every single day, your kids come across more content in one day than people faced or encountered their entire lives. And guess what? Is that content neutral towards your kids? The vast majority of it is driven by an agenda that would want to put them not in the will of God. And have y'all noticed that the world is more unashamed that is actually out to claim and consume our kids? It doesn't even care that, you, that we know anymore. It's like out of the shadows now. It's just like, listen, if you don't agree, you're a bigot or you're, you, 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 I mean, you, you must be intolerant in some way because you stand for the truth or stand for righteous principles or the way God's word says the world ought to work. Now there's no shame. And chasing after to consume and claim our kids for the ways of the world. This is the external pressure of the world. If you haven't noticed, I'm sure, I can't imagine what growing up in Rome was, right? When like Paul wrote the, so I don't know that it's the, it's the most difficult time in history. But I can tell you now, in my lifetime, the pressure of the world has only increased. And now kids are, exp- I'm like, I did not see the iPhone until I was in seminary. When did you first see it? Right? Now, our kids know a world of information encounters that we did not face. So there's the external pressure of the world, but you also, you also there's the, um, the internal pressure of their own heart. Now, nobody really likes to talk about this because this is the tough news about us as human beings. But did you realize nobody comes into this world an angel? And I'm not talking about the flapping wings kind. I'm talking about like, the do good all the time kind. Nobody shows up with default settings in their heart towards righteousness. We don't. We, we, we show up with default settings towards selfishness and unrighteousness. I've heard it said no better than this. The seeds of every sin come planted in human nature. Did you hear? The seed of every sin comes already planted in human nature nature in the heart you say Kyle where does scripture affirm that listen to where the psalmist described this Psalm 58 3 listen to this the wicked are estranged from the womb they go astray from birth where did the seeds of sin where were they first planted they're planted at the time of birth from conception Psalm 51 5 behold This is David, the man after God's own heart, who did so much for the Lord, who also made some major mistakes. But listen, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. It's not that his mother's relationship with his father was wrong. It's just saying that, listen, even all of that, when I was conceived, I was brought forth a sinner from the time I was conceived. And so our kids face the pressure of an external world, but they also face the internal pressure of their own sin nature and heart. And so think about it like this, an unproductive life for Christ. I said an unproductive one for Christ or a destructive one living for the ways of the world is the natural harvest of the seeds that we come planted with. Without outside intervention, without the supernatural grace of God arresting us, snatching our hearts out of sin, opening our eyes to our need of rescue and forgiveness and literally changing us and making us alive, we are destined to produce the harvest we show up with that's in our heart. This is why God gives every child to parents. Because all that those sin seeds need to grow and produce a harvest is water from the world and nothing done by parents to intervene. And what's natural will naturally happen. And so the only way something's going to change is if something supernatural happens, which comes by the power of prayer and the intervention of God. Listen, to speak of that intervention, maybe you're in the room or listening online and you're like, I'm not sure I've had that intervention in my life. Maybe you're not sure if your kids have or your grandkids have. Did you know that intervention was an answer from heaven? God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son 
to do for you what you couldn't do, to snatch you and rescue you and forgive you from what you couldn't do for yourself, to give you a righteousness you didn't have, a righteousness only he could provide by living a sinless life for us, dying for our sin in our place sinlessly for us, defeating death for us, saying that he's returning for us and saying all we have to do by faith is realizing the gift that he's provided in his life, death, burial, and resurrection and promised return is to say yes to him by faith, to call on him to save us. Have you done that? Has there come a point in time in your life you realize you needed divine intervention, otherwise you're hopelessly lost forever, which you are without that divine intervention. You've been saved. You confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. You believe God raised Jesus from the dead in your heart, and you know you've been snatched from what the natural result of who you are in your sin, and you've been saved. Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know that? If not... You can call out to God right now and ask for that. That's what our kids need most. And thus, that's our first prayer. And so our children, y'all, we pray. Listen, just let me catch you up to where we are. You pray not only for the potential, full potential of God's will to be lived out, but we also pray for protection for what's not God's will because of the pressures of the world and the internal pressure of their own heart. So parents, prayer is the most powerful tool you have. The Bible says lift your hands to heaven. I think that's God's way of saying pray with all that you've got as if the lives of your kids depended on your soldiering for them in the spiritual battle of prayer. That's what that means. That don't mean throw up a prayer when you feel like it, when it just hits your mind, or a Hail Mary when kind of things go wrong. That means showing up every day, battle lines, front of the gate, saying, I'm going to war for my kids. That's the kind of command God says to parents to do. And so, I want to talk about how to do that. Um, And as I share some practical ways to do that, let me just be frank with you and say, as I've studied and prepared for this, listen, I have found myself lacking. I mean, I'll be honest, right? Even as a pastor, like I would tell you that there's hardly a day that goes by I don't articulate the names of my kids to God in prayer. I typically do. Um, But I don't, I, I, I often many days am not praying with any intentional battle plan. Uh, without thinking through the specifics of exactly where they are and what they're facing and their personalities and their strengths and their weaknesses and claiming scripture that I've prepared in advance to ask God to fulfill on their behalf. I've got a long way to go in this. Maybe you do too, but let me just walk us through some ways how. Number one, pray daily for your kids by name. Pray daily for your kids by name. Now, let me just kind of walk you through that in a way that sounds super simple. Let me kind of make this really intentional. Number, kind of the way I've heard this explained best is it would be best mom and dad grandparent, uh, to find a time once a year that you're going to get away somehow while you're on vacation, while you're doing something that gives you some extra time that you can focus and set aside and take you a prayer journal, something you can write in. You're going to use it for the year as your prayer journal for your kids. You're going to write each of their names and you're going to make a year-long customized prayer list for each one of your kids by name. You're going to do this based on asking God for help and what you should pray for your kids. You're going to do this based on their strengths and their weaknesses, their personality, uh, their tendencies, their gifts, their talents, their struggles, the obstacles and season that they're in, and on and on. You're going to make this customized list that you want to pray for the year. It's not that you'll pray every single thing you write down for that year every single day, but it's that you can open it up every day, call on the God of heaven, and these ways you've strategically asked for God to intervene in their lives, to be effective, calling out on God in specific ways, specific requests for God to be involved in the life of your child. So pray for them daily by name, but the tools you need are prayer journal, once a year setting aside time to write out your plan so that you can execute it on a day by day basis. You say, Kyle, what would I even do to get started? Listen, I just made a list of a top 10 prayer requests for parents for their kids. These may not be your top 10, but if they help you get started, then that's great, all right? So let's check them out. Number one, they would receive and love Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. We've already really covered that one. That's bottom line. Number two, they would know and love the truth of God's Word. Number three, they would seek the kingdom of God first and live filled with the Holy Spirit. Number Four, they would grow up into spiritual maturity 
in Christ. Number five, they would hate sin and they would literally hunger and thirst for righteousness. Number six, they would glorify God with their bodies and flee sexual immorality and every form of impurity. Number seven, they'd have healthy, encouraging, wise, and godly friendships. The character of the people we keep affects our character. Number eight, committed to a local church, loving the bride of Christ. Number nine, knowing God's will for their life and walking wisely in it. And number ten, to find a godly spouse if marriage is what God has in store for them. That may not be your top ten list, but maybe that's one to get you started that you could expand out from there. are specific things to claim and ask by the power of God would be realized in your kid's life. James says, you, they, have not because... Don't let that be... Don't let that be the case in your life. Number two, pray scripture for your kids. Do you notice that beside all of these, I've got at least one scripture reference? Why pray the word of God? Because it's literally the inspired word of God. It's the mind of God. It's the heart of God. The promises of God. It's the sword of the spirit by which we wield the power of God against the forces of darkness. When you pray the content of the word of God, you're not praying your ideas, your thoughts, and your wants. You're praying God's ideas, his wants, his word, and his desires. It's like you magnify the power of prayer because you insert into prayer literally The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, which nothing can stand against, which will last forever, which the Bible says never is ineffective or unfruitful. It always does not ever return void, always accomplishes what it's been set out to do. It's like a rock that can crush, that can shatter even the hardest of heart to be sensitive and tender to the things of God. It is living and active. We pray the Word of God. By the way, real practical, if you're willing to, And making sure you got a scripture reference next to what you're asking for your kid. And you're being honest. You won't pray things you want that God doesn't want. Because we can easily slip into praying selfish things for our kids. Or things that we think would be right and good that may not line up with God's word. Praying that way will only make you frustrated, disappointed. Pray the scripture for your kids. Number three, pray as a couple for your children. After you get alone, do your customized prayer list. Um, If you can, get with your spouse, compare notes, create and customize, polish your list based on what you may have left out, what they included. See where you're on the same page. See how the Lord led you to pray for your child. Share answers to your prayers that maybe you're both praying for. Encourage one another and you're praying together for them. And, And one of the ways you can do this is go beyond just praying for them And let them know you're praying for your kids and kids just kind of hold your ears for a second. But how about your kids show up for the first day of school with a note with your prayer for them that day in their backpack that they didn't know they'd find. In their lunchbox they didn't know they'd find. Stuffed in their shoe when they go to put on their shoe they didn't know they would find. On their bathroom mirror in the dash of their car. What if you began letting the words of God that you're praying for your kids wash over the lives of your kids. So literally... They're going to be a lamp unto their feet, whether they thought about them or or, or opened their Bible that day or not. They're going to see them and know what you're asking. And to do this together. Number four, pray with other parents for your children. One of the most powerful things that parents, praying parents, have done is to partner with others. Literally getting together for the purpose of praying for their kids. Many of you that I know in our church have done this over the years. And when you do this, you team up and strengthen numbers to encourage one another to keep praying and not faint. And keep this up. And when you do so, you, by the way, you multiply your joys and the answers to your prayer request. And you divide your burdens. which you, The Bible says to carry one another's burdens. And by the way, many a parent has found the lifeline they needed in a difficult season. Because they put themselves around other supporting parents that could uphold them up in prayer when their kids were struggling mightily. Get with other parents to pray and lift your hands to heaven for the sake of your kids. Number five is to pray specifically through the seasons of parenting. There's a lot of parents that just kind of have an expiration date on parenting at age like 18 or 21 in the lives of their kids. Don't, don't admit that if you do, but you know they kind of want to go like this. Man, we just get them out of the house, off the payroll, and be done. Maybe off the payroll, maybe one thing, but you're never done as a parent. Um, Just like life has different seasons, so does parenting. 
In fact, the Bible speaks to a lot of these seasons of life and how to handle them as parents. Um, one of the things you've got to realize is that prayer is one of the primary things you never stop doing as a parent. Through every season of parenting, you pray. It's the pow- most powerful tool you have at any and every season. So let me just walk you through what, uh, what's not original with me. And you might tweak these. Your child might not fit these exactly. There'd be overlap. All right, I realize all that. But these are just categories to be insightful for your prayer life, for the life of your kids. Number one, the season of protection. These are these years of zero to five. Those early precious years in the life of a child. Then, of course, they start crawling and everything is a hazard. Every outlet, every cord, every, every, everything is a hazard. Anything not anchored to the wall, I mean, it's crazy, right? So it's a, it's a season of protection. It's also the season of addressing the three Ds that your child came programmed with in their sin nature. You know what they are? Don't deny them, all right? Every kid's got them. Disobedience, dishonesty, and disrespect. The seeds are there. You let them get water, they're just going to grow to other things. So you're addressing the three D's and you're having to say no a lot and you're protecting a lot. It's those early years, all right? Then they go from the season of protection to the season of preparation, ages 6 to 18. But I will say ages 6 to 12 are probably a unique season and kind of 13 to 18 are another half of a different type of preparation, all falling within what we'll call the training years. You're going to know these years are here when that first school bell rings, And off they go, and you can't protect them from all those hazards that you did in your home. And everywhere you went at the grocery store, and everywhere in between. So you start now developing a relationship with them, of providing instruction, of preparation and training, of implementing in your life, with their life, routines and habits, and responses and plans and ways of living that will help set them on the right course. Third is the season of partnering, age 18 to 25. These are more like coaching years. This season really begins when a child leaves home officially, but can even begin earlier in the teenage years. It can continue in their young single adult life, sometimes even shortly into their even newlywed life, because here's what happens when marriage comes. When your child, hear me, some some parents need to hear this. When your child says, I do... It's time for you as a parent to say, I don't, to a lot of things. Let me say that again. When your child says, I do, you got to be ready to say, I don't. This is the leave and cleave time that Scripture says ought to happen. You can inhibit it from happening if you don't transition with the season. You will stunt the growth and marriage and life of your child by your overreach in a season by which the season has changed. Parents' role can change in this way. Sometimes you'll be part of their lives. Oftentimes you'll be an observer. But all times you can be a partner in prayer and in other ways, especially at their request. But one challenge for parents in this season of partnering is that more often than not, you become a silent partner in their lives as they form the life of a new couple. And during these years, we give guidance as a parent, and you can give instruction as they ask for it. But it's really no longer your right to give whenever you want to as mom and dad anymore. A new family unit has formed. They've said I do, which means you say I don't to a lot of things. Number four is the season of privilege. I've got the age of 25 plus on there. They can give and take some years. These are what we'll call the friendship years. This season is marked by an adult relationship with your child. No longer are you primarily relating to them as mom and dad. You're relating them as an adult friend. You're now peers. And the level of your success in this season of parenting is dependent on successfully moving through those other first three. And so now you got to think about all this. What was once a right of yours in their life as mom and dad? All it took to do it or to say it was because you're mom or dad. You no longer have that right. You have a privilege. It's the season of privilege. If you presume upon what you think are rights, you will forfeit your privileges. And you don't want to do that. You want to partner in a season of privilege as a friend, as mom and dad. Number six, pray and never stop praying for your children. 
pray and never stop praying. I know the hardest part is what about when you don't feel like your prayers are being answered. Remember your part in the battle is to pray and God's part is to fight. Your part is to pray, God's part is to fight. And remember this too, your enemy is not your child or grandchild. Your enemy is the unseen one behind the scenes out to steal, kill, and destroy. This is a spiritual battle to be fought and waged on your knees. Stand strong. Do not give up. Never, ever, ever let disappointment or what you feel like is unanswered prayer cause you to quit praying. As long as you are praying, heaven is moving whether you can see heaven moving or not. I'm going to say that again. As long as you're praying, heaven is moving. God is fighting. Whether you can see it or not. So don't stop. Prayer is the most powerful tool you've been given. God's not called you to be a perfect parent. Take a deep breath. Even if you could be, that's not what your kid needs you to be. He or she needs you to be a warrior in prayer on their behalf. When L.R. Scarborough preached his first sermon... Called to preach, he was as a result of his parents' prayers. He was at First Baptist Church, Abilene, Texas. His father, George, a former pastor, was on the second row, up close so he could hear and see well. On the front row were a couple ladies that were good friends. And as as George's son, L.R., started to preach and started to exemplify that fiery passion he had as a preacher that he'd become known for, One of the ladies reached over to her friend and said, He's surpassing his father, isn't he? George heard it. He was right behind him. He wasn't jealous. He just smiled. After the service was over, he tapped that lady on the shoulder. And he said, Ma'am, he ought to beat me. He's standing on my shoulders. Your kids are going to stand on your shoulders, like it or not, good shoulders or not. Prayer supported shoulders, hands lifted up to heaven, strong shoulders, or shoulders not. They're going to stand on your shoulders. And the shoulders they need most to stand on are ones flexed towards heaven literally every day God has not called you to be a perfect parent he's called you to be a praying parent and prayer is the most powerful weapon you have prayer moves heaven on behalf of those who ask and all of hell cannot resist the hand of heaven on behalf of our kids, grandkids, and whomever God puts in your life to wield by his power the sword of the Spirit in prayer for their lives, for the glory of God. Father, I want to ask right now that you would lead us to be praying parents like never before. Father, I pray that our eyes would be opened to the strategic criticalness of the battle to be waged on our knees. God, I pray that we would be faithful prayer warriors in the lives of our kids and grandkids. Father, that in other ways that we could serve children in the next generation, such as like through Read to Grow, our mentor canes, we'd say, here I am, send me, use us, Father. Father, if anyone in the room or under the sound of my voice online has never experienced the intervention of God, through prayer, calling out on you for salvation. Today would be the day, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, as you stand with me, right before we sing, let me say this. Maybe you have been in prayer every day for your kids. Maybe you need to continue that. Maybe you want to start it. But what a better time and place than to get on your knees or to come stand if you can't kneel on behalf of your kids, to lift your hands to heaven. To do so, maybe... Maybe you need to come and call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Maybe you know a child or a grandchild far from God. You need to intervene in prayer asking for God to snatch them back. You come pray. You need to talk to an encourager. You come.
Come as a couple, come as a family. But you come, you start today or continue today, which you know God's called you to do. Would you stand as we sing? You come, we wait for you. Amen, church family. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. And uh, guest, if you've joined us today, and so glad you have, I pray that 
uh, you'll take some time, jot down some info for me so I can give you a call this week on that card. We won't harass you, I promise. And uh, I would love to connect with you and uh, just share with you how to take next steps in the life of our church family. And uh, we'd love to show you how to do that. I'm going to slip out and be in the lobby. We'd love to actually shake your hand, too, if you'd be willing to stop by uh, before you check out some announcements. On the screen, John, you yes, think sir. it's going to work? We're going to see if it's going to work. All right, check out these things. It's been so good to worship together in the house of the Lord. Lift your hands to heaven this week every day. Amen? Our prayers move heaven, so let's do it together. Y'all check out these things on the screen. Good morning, church family. Here are some exciting things coming up in the life of CFBC. Today is Move Up Sunday in our children's and student areas as we kick off the new Sunday school year. As we begin the Answers Bible curriculum, we want to make you aware of the family devotionals that we're making available. These devotionals supplement the lessons and encourage family interaction during the week. If you've not picked up a copy of the devotional for Unit 1, pick one up in the lobby today. If you're interested in singing in the worship choir, come to the fall choir kickoff tonight at 5 p.m. for some food and fellowship. Tacos will be served and you will hear information about the exciting things coming up this fall for the choir. And again, you cannot beat free tacos. Looking ahead, make a note that our Wednesday night meals will begin on August 23rd at 5.30. The following Wednesday, August 30th, classes for all ages will begin and take place from 6.30 to 7.30. And finally, as superintendent of Carsville City Schools, I want to urge you to be in prayer for all of our area schools as we begin this academic year. Our county schools began this past Tuesday while our city schools will begin this Thursday. Please pray for our administrators, teachers, and students. We need protection, provision, and wisdom from the Lord, and we pray that he would work in our schools to glorify himself and make his presence known. Also, mark on your calendars that next Sunday evening, August 13th, is our annual prayer walk for our city and county schools. Each school in the area will have a host between 4 and 5 p.m. Our student pastor, Jason Moore, will be hosting at Woodland High School, but feel free to go to the school of your choice to pray for that particular school. And for more information on these and all events taking place at CFBC, visit carswellfirst.com slash events. All right, amen. Thank you, Mark. Let's all stand together and say as we do each week, church, as you go, we go too. Have a great day.